a pretty high percentage of hub. With, in the United States, probably there are 100 exit counselings per year among all the exit counselors. So that means the vast, vast majority of people leave cults without exit counseling. And one would assume that for many of these, they have families who are concerned. Or if they're SGAs leaving the group, they're leaving families behind that they're concerned about. And very, very few of them uh, engage in exit counseling. But does that mean that there's nothing else that they can do? And the, the uh, presupposition of this talk is that no, the answer is no, there are things they can do. So, I'm going to leave that. And this table, which you can't, maybe you can't see too much, is interesting because it compares two surveys. One done by Conway and Siegelman in 1978, and one that I did in 1991. And it, both of them drew... Is there any way to uh, get that to a straight blurry? Does everyone see... Can anyone... Uh, well, I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll it's, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the key, the, the key data anyway. Um, change the view to page view. Change the view to page view. And hit the plus up here too and it'll make it bigger. I don't know. Oh, file? Oh, view. There it is. Okay. Zoom in. Okay. Thank you. Um, both the Conway and Siegelman sample and my sample were drawn from the broad cult awareness network. They were snowball samples, which basically means you got subjects whenever you could. So they're not necessarily representative of the whole cult population, but they are fairly representative of the people who come into the uh, cult Education Network. Conway and Siegelman had 426 subjects, I had 301. Their 426 subjects came from 48 groups, mine came from 101 different groups. The percent who were deprogrammed in their subject, and deprogramming at that time meant kidnapping, abduction, was 70%, only 13% in my sample had been deprogrammed. 60% uh, in mine had had no intervention. Conway and Siegelman didn't even ask about that. And in my sample, 9% had been kicked out of their groups. Now, at the time, I was surprised when we got that figure, but I really shouldn't have been surprised, because if you think of a cult as a leader trying to get people to do what he wants, and he does whatever he has to do to get them to do what he wants, those who resist and don't do what he wants, he's got to get rid of. Okay, so... And, and we found in other studies that Paul Martin did that about 10% seemed to be kicked out, at least within the sample that comes into our network. But this is an interesting uh, fact, that the percent of the top five groups, five groups in the Conway and Siegelman study, uh, Divine Light Mission, Scientology, ISCON, uh, Way International, and I forget what the other one was, they were 76% of their sample. The top five groups in mine was 33%. Oh, the Moonies was the other one, of course. The largest group in Conway and Siegelman was the Unification Church. 44% of the people in their sample came out of the Unification Church. And that's why if you read the early writings from that period, it sounds like, everything sounds like a Mooney. Every cult was sort of looked at through the lens of the Unification Church. And it was inaccurate because the Unification Church is not at all representative of most cults. Most of them are different. They certainly have similarities in the dynamics, but the surface features, like the Unification Church, would meet people on the streets, invite them to a dinner, then they go to a three-day workshop, then they go to a seven-day workshop, and a 30-day workshop. They had a, a system that was different, but 44%. In mine, the, the largest group was 16%, and if you look at some of the individual groups, the Unification Church was only 5% in my sample. Scientology was the only one that seemed to hang on 
and, and persist, the 16% in mind, which was actually more than in Conway and Siegelman's. The way international, 2% for me, ISCON 2%, DLM went from 11% to 1%. Now, the other important distinction is the average age of joining. For Conway and Siegelman, it was 21. For me, it was 24.8. For Conway and Siegelman, people were in their group an average of 2.7 years. In my sample, they were in an average of 6.7 years. My the, the statistics from the sample I did in 91 is similar also to statistics we've gotten from our ex-cult member workshops, where the average age is about 36 or 37 years old. On average, people have been out of their groups about six years. Sometimes we've had people who are out of their groups for 20 years, right? They come to the workshop and the light bulb goes on in their head. Uh, and they've been out of their group six years. They were in an average of about six years. So even by 1991, we were dealing with a population that was very different from the early population of the late 70s and early 80s. It was much more diverse. It was older. Because it was older, it meant that more of them were married in the cult. Your typical cult member in our network in 1978 was a college student. And of those who joined cults when they were college students, we found about 40% dropped out of college, which was one of the key things that caught the parents a lot. In 1991, we did not have the term second generation adult. We did not talk about SGAs. We didn't, we didn't, we, we sort of knew that kids were being born in cults. We used to talk about children in cults. But enough, the, 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 the cult population boom of the 60s and 70s had produced children, but by 1991, they weren't old enough to be coming out as adults. They started to come out in the late 90s, would you say? And that's, and we, yeah, yeah. And the second generation adults, as, as many people in the conference have said, have specific kinds of needs. One of the needs that they have is they're concerned about families as well. Only their families are in the group. Lois Kendall, a PhD in England, was raised in a Bible-based group in England. She did a PhD, a, a massive research project on that subject. She grew up in a family with, I think, six siblings. She was the first one to leave at about 17 years old. And over a period of 20 years, she got all, except I think she's got one or two siblings still in the group, I think. But she got, and, and it was largely through her doing that she was able to get her parents and most of her siblings out of the group, and not with an exit council, okay, but she did impact, and she is, is not alone in that. In recent conferences, we, I've, I've used a survey to have people sign up for pre-conference events, and I collect data in the survey, and one of the interesting things is that of people who say they have parents in, a, in they have family members in a group, which I think, if I remember correctly, was 15 to 20 percent, uh, something like two-thirds of them were SGAs. So, in 1985, if we did a, a conference like this one, literally 90% of the people would have been parents whose kids had joined cults. Today, those parents represent fewer than 10% of the people uh, coming to our cults. I'm talking to our conference. <laughs> 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 uh, the, 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 the psychological dynamics behind that slip is that fundraising is really hard, and if we were a cult, it would be so much easier. <laughs> okay, so what that says is the population has changed. It's much more varied, much more complex, difficult cases, and it means that that old deprogramming model of grab the kid, bring them to the deprogrammer, the deprogrammer is going to tell them about all the dirty linen about the group, and you're going to get them out. That does not apply. Exit counseling, which Carol was a pioneer in developing, was a much more sophisticated approach. And as she'll say uh, shortly later, I better take my phone out to keep track of the time. Uh, she'll talk about what, was some of, what are some of the conditions that make an exit counseling feasible. 
So, let me go now to conflict resolution. Uh, is the nope, that's publisher. I never get these icons right. Okay, slideshow. This isn't supposed to do it like that. <laughs> Anyhow, you can see it, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, as I said, conflict resolution is really a fancy way of making a bad situation better. And you can read uh, religion, okay, belief in and reverence for supernatural power or powers. Basically, religion can be interpreted broadly so that it's, it can really apply to groups that may not be overtly religious. Sometimes political cults fu function, functionally they're, function they're functioning like religions. Uh, conflict, the state of disharmony between incompatible or antithetical persons, ideas or interests clash. Resolve brings to a usually successful conclusion, resolving the conflict. So re conflict, religious conflict resolution, the attempt to reduce or end the state of disharmony existing between two or more people, usually family members, resulting from the difference in religious beliefs, practices, or commitment, with religion being defined in a broad sense. So deprogramming was very attractive in the early days because a parent basically contacted a deprogrammer, said, here's a picture of my kid, he, you know, and we, we, and we can arrange for him to come, you talk to him. It was a it was relative, relatively easy, although it was traumatic for the parents because they were scared, uh, very scared, I won't get vulgar. Um, and because they didn't know it would work. And in fact, in a, in a survey I did way back then, only about 60% of the time the deprogramming succeeded. So in 40% of the cases it failed. And it, it was a... It, some of the cult apologists at the time used to try to think that it was just overbearing parents who were jealous of the cult and they wanted to control their kids. It was a total misconception. The parents were scared. They were worried. They didn't embark on a deprogramming gleefully. Uh, but it was a way of ending the conflict. Because if it succeeded, the kid came out, usually the kid was grateful, the family was happy, and things more or less ultimately in time returned to normal. But in these more complex cases that we face, it's a whole lot more difficult. Uh, and some of the factors in conflict is each person tends to blame a group or the other person, when in fact all contribute to the conflict. I don't think there are innocent parties in interpersonal conflicts. That is not to say that we're all equal and you're equally to blame as I am. It may not be equal, and it's really equal that everybody has some, some contribution to it. Often, neither fully understands the sources of the conflict. Much conflict results from communication failures. There's a um, useful uh, statement in communications which goes, the message intended is not necessarily the message received. I may want to communicate something to you, but I don't grab out of my brain the words that accurately communicate what I intend to communicate. If it always did, there'd be no need to revise things that we write. You know, I write things, I sleep on it, and two days later, I say, no, 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 that's not what I meant to say. So, first place where communication can get distorted, I don't say what I mean to say. Now, the recipient of the communication hears the words that I utter, but may interpret those words in a different way from how I intend them to be interpreted. So, the wife says, did you take out the garbage? And the husband hears, you never take out the garbage, you can't. <laughs> you, <laughs> I am so sick of telling you to take out the garbage, okay? And the husband says, yes, I took out the garbage, okay? And the wife says, what's he, what's wrong with him? <laughs> yeah, and it's a, it's a miscommunication. She may have actually not been saying it 
in, in a nasty way. She may have merely wanted to know if he took out the garbage. And his response, in a sense, conjures up a whole history of conflict. And he responds not to the message that was intended, but to a message that he heard. And then he responds back with a message. And that's how communication is. We think it's easy, because it's easy to say things, but it's not so easy to say things with clarity and with accuracy and with respect for the other person's interpretation and response to your communication. So communication is really vital, and I think what they've, the exit council is a really done a great job with in the parent training is teaching parents how to communicate effectively. Okay, so now another thing is the need to be right. I'll change this, I don't have to sit. Um, Alfred Adler, who was the first to break with Freud, had a neat saying where he said, people would rather be right than happy. And what he meant was that we have our theories of how the world works. And even though we're not happy, these, these theories, or what today we might call schemas, they guide us and they more or less work for us. They, they may put us in a sort of a neurotic position of feeling like a failure or something, and we're not happy, but if the person goes into therapy, the implicit message of therapy is if you want to be happy, you have to change. And people resist changing. And that's really what Adler was talking about, that you can improve your situation if you change your thinking, but people are reluctant to change their thinking. Uh, and they will cling to their assumptions about life that have worked for them, even in situations where they're not working. And they need help to make that change uh, successfully. And that is really one of the things I think that occurs in conflict resolution. That, and it's a challenge often for parents that you have to open up to different points of view and different perspectives. You might actually be wrong about some things. And if you're not open to being wrong, it's going to be difficult to change. And if you don't change, what makes you think the situation is going to change in your relationship with the loved one? Uh, it, 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 the, the refusal of one party to change puts the burden on the other party to change. And resentment can, can arise from that. And conflicts, there's an over-reliance on words which you know, gets back to the communications things. In religious conflicts, sometimes are even more difficult because we tend to not talk about religion or politics. Not many of us really know much about religion, even if we go to church every week. We, most of us don't know nearly as much as uh, we ought to know, or think we know, or pretend to know. And this can also cause conflicts in a cultic situation. Now, why do families become concerned? Usually it's they notice disturbing behavioral changes. Sometimes they may just disapprove of the group's beliefs or practices, or they feel that the family's religion has been betrayed, uh, or they've heard bad things about the group. You know, they read an article to call the group a cult. Or they don't know anything about the group, so they're just afraid of it because it's different. Sometimes families are concerned and it's a false alarm. Most of the time, if they've come into our network, they've made a layman's assessment of their situation. And usually, as I tell fellow mental health professionals, don't dismiss the parents. Uh, in the case of SGAs, the family members, uh, they, they, chances are, most of the time, they have reason to be concerned. But sometimes they don't. And sometimes they focus their concern on the wrong thing. And the biggest mistake families make is they focus on the concept cult. So parents will call me or email me and they say, is such and such a cult? And I like to say, suppose I told you it isn't a cult, would you stop worrying? Okay, and nine times out of ten the answer is no. So then I say, well, what is it that you're worried about? What, what have you seen? What have you observed? And I go to the notice disturbing behave behaviors. And 
if you can help someone make a behavioral assessment of the problems and determine that the problem behaviors are connected to things going on in the group, at that point it does not matter what you call the group. And from the standpoint of exit counseling or uh, conflict resolution, not clinging to that cult word is an advantage because it means a different thing to the person in the cult than it may, may mean to you. And it really is not helpful to focus on that. You know, in the old days in particular, parents would get, a, they get an article from the New York Times and put it in front of the kid, look, look, the New York Times says your group is a cult. You know? And it was useless, it was futile. Because the New York Times, it's controlled by the devil. You know? It has no, no, no credibility whatsoever. Okay, so, and how have families handled these situations? In the old deprogramming days, it was basically wait and hope, and the main, if, if you couldn't institute a deprogramming, and the, the, the classic thing was maintain communication, but it was basically waiting and hoping. And sometimes they'd seek help from clergy or other helping professionals, but usually that just was waiting and hoping, or even worse. Uh, and former members seeking help from clergy. We, we did a survey a few years ago, and almost half, maybe more than half of them, about half of them, had approached clergy or churches or synagogues for help. Uh, but when we asked them to rate how helpful they were, it was really uh, disturbing. Like, something like 70 or 80 percent of them said, not at all helpful. Uh, and that's what's caused us to start the Spiritual Safe Haven Project and we're trying to do outreach to churches and synagogues, but we're only in the early stages of that. And the other option was to hire an intervention specialist. Okay, I've already talked about this and the numbers, I started with that. And the goals, the goals of religious conflict resolution then would be to improve communication between the parties Increase each party's understanding of the perspective and concerns of the other party. It isn't that the person in the cult is benighted and dull and ignorant and foolish and, and, and I'm enlightened and you have to come around, the cult person has to come around to my way of thinking. If you approach it like that, chances are you're going to wind up in a fight and you may wind up with a, a fractured relationship, if not a, a completely terminated relationship. Uh, and it's important to identify points of agreement, toleration, and disagreement. It's obvious what points of agreement mean. I make a distinction between points of toleration and disagreement. Points of toleration means I don't agree with you, but I can tolerate a, 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 uh, an enduring disagreement is something that we just, there's no way that we can come to any kind of harmony on this. And the most you can do is agree to disagree. That's usually the best way to deal with those things. But some of them like toleration. So you may have a child involved in a group and, um, you know, he devotes a lot of time to the group. You know, he holds, he's got a, he's got a full-time job. But he goes to the group on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sunday, and you don't like it, and you don't see it as healthy. But you want to build your relationship with him, so you tolerate. It. You know, you don't like it, you don't approve of it, you don't agree with it, but it's not something that you're going to continually disagree with. You tolerate, it. and I think it's important to 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 distinguish those things because if you can tolerate more aspects of a, an involved person's life, even though you disagree with those, or you disapprove of them, it will make it easier to, to build a relationship because you don't have as much conflict and strain. And then through improved communication and understanding, you can, the goal would be to increase the points of agreement and toleration, which is essentially improving the relationship. And through negotiation, manage remaining points of disagreement. Sometimes, so sometimes parents have essentially negotiated with their child. Look, I understand you're very devoted and you're busy with this group, but I'm your mother, 
you know, can't you at least call me once a week? Okay, and so the child may want you to not criticize his guru or something. So in exchange, okay, I'll stop criticizing with, call me once a week. It's a negotiation. But it's a negotiation that exists in the broader strategic plan, which is to improve relationships, which may create the opportunity for an exit counseling at some point, or may enhance the probability that someone will voluntarily leave a group. But you can't, it's very difficult to plan out a detailed strategy from here to exit. You know, because there are too many unknowns along the pathway. And often you have to have a hierarchy of goals. And for many families, uh, or SGAs with family members and groups, the first goal is often to improve communication. Sometimes it's just to establish communication because communication has been cut off. I mean, it's very common families will contact us after the kid in a cult has broken communication completely. So that kind of flexibility is really essential. And I think if you're going to have a conflict resolution approach, each party must recognize that this is not a process that leads to victory for one side or the other. It's not a power struggle. It's an, an attempt to enhance a relationship. And sometimes families just cannot get out of that power struggle mode. And it can be very destructive and it can totally uh, sabotage any kind of intervention attempt. Each party must be willing to change. Each party must be willing to admit error. Each party must be willing to listen, to place his or her beliefs, values, and judgments aside in order to hear the other party. Uh, that's why I, one of the little points of advice I often give family members is be more ready to listen than to lecture. And this is especially an issue with parents because parents like to lecture their children. I do it. You know, every, all parents do it. Uh, but in a cult situation, it can be counterproductive. And when you're lecturing, you're not getting information. Okay? And you don't even know how your information is being heard. Because remember, the message intended isn't the necessarily the message received. If you're listening, you're learning. And frequently your child is the best source of information. Or if you're an SGA, your parent or your sibling is the best source of information about his or her relationship to the group. As an SGA, you know a lot about the group, but you may not know all that you think you know about your sibling's specific relationship within the group. And each party has to be able to negotiate in good faith which means negotiation isn't a manipulation. Well, I'll agree to this, but I'm really only agreeing to this because I'm going to try to manipulate you over here. When you get into manipulation battles, you're an amateur compared to the cult. And you're not going to do too well in manipulation. Which is not to say that some manipulation doesn't go on. But if you're going to manipulate, you better be really smart about it because uh, otherwise it's going to backfire. And I will now turn this over to, Pat, to Joe and Carol. As, as I said, I gave the theory, and now they're going to give you the reality, uh, and talk about some real cases. First, Carol will talk about the conditions that improve the chances of an exit counseling working. Okay? 